if you think about it, it's just one simple idea. Sometimes complexity is the enemy of execution. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Maria, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Hey, Hala. Thank you for having me and hello to all the listeners. I hope you're having a great day. Yes, I am so excited to have you on the show. It is such a pleasure. You are an award-winning art advisor, author, and curator, and you are a true expert when it comes to creativity for entrepreneurs with years of research and experience in both business and art. And today we're going to cover key concepts from your new book, How Creativity Rules the World. But before we do that, you have a really, really interesting backstory, and I'd love to share that with our audience. So I found out You were born in Caracas, Venezuela, uh, to a conservative Catholic family. You say you often went to studios and museums every Sunday in Caracas. And even though you came from a really artistic family, they insisted that you took a traditional career path. So I'd love to understand what it was like growing up for you and your education and your early career. Yes. Well, you know, you've said it perfectly. And uh, when I was little, I wanted to be a singer. And when I was in, you know, primary school, the I was always chosen for the festivals and to be the lead singer and things like that. And my parents thought it was very cute. And as I grew older, I started to get a little bit more serious. And when I was maybe 18, I got this invitation to audition for a band that was a touring band and I got accepted. Mm. And uh, when I presented this to my parents, they said, absolutely not. If you want to do that, you have to move out and, uh, you know, pick up your things, particularly my mom. I think my dad probably could have at some point, you know, agreed but my mom was like no that is a job for hookers and in this house you're going to be an attorney or a doctor or an engineer or things that she thought were decent according to her way of thinking and so I well I was very brokenhearted but at the same time when you grew up in Venezuela, you just can't leave your house and say, I'm going to wait tables and I'm going to make money with tips and move in studio apartment. You can't do that, really. You can't. First, very dangerous country. And second, uh, those opportunities really don't exist. It's a very different culture. So I, I studied really hard and I said, I'm going to go to law school because I was very, very good at reading and synthesizing information and writing and nothing else really was good. I mean, I was not good at math. I didn't want to see blood. So those were not options for me. Mm -hmm. So I ended up applying to diverse law schools in the United States because I wanted to leave. That was the other thing. I didn't see myself there in Venezuela for a variety of reasons, but I just wanted to grow. And I got accepted by Harvard Law School. So I moved from little Caracas to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I graduated in year 2000, and I moved to New York right away to practice law and to take the bar exam and all those things. And I did, and I did that for nine years of my life with uh, success but misery. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I was successful as a corporate attorney, but I was very miserable, and I was hiding it to myself for a long time because you have a lot of shame around the idea that you've spent so much time and money getting a law degree, and then you practice, and then you sort of like build some sort of reputation, and then you're like, no, this is really absolutely horrendous and I do not belong at all to this space and I'm going to quit and open something for me that Mm. I love. And so, you know, it was a a very challenging period of my life, but I am thankful that I was able to be truthful to myself and who I I am actually Mm -hmm. and to take that plunge. And here we are. It's been 13 years since that. And so amazing. Amazing. And so let's let's just rewind here a bit because you went to Harvard Law. People would 
kill for that mm-hmm. opportunity. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that had a lot to do with you being a lawyer for so long because here you were, you were like, well, I graduated from like the <laughs> most prestigious school you could. I did the hard things, you know, I messed my time in law school. I took the LSAT, I, you know, I learned all of this. It's so hard to let go of a career that you've invested in. So how did you know that it was completely not for you? Like, what were the feelings that you felt in terms of knowing that it was unfulfilling and not for you? And what was that turning point in terms of actually quitting that career? Well, there was, you know, you, it's like a divorce, right? Like, it's like, you never, it's not one thing, right? It's like a million things that happen (laughs) along the way, right? Uh, I'm not divorced, by the way, I'm married, but I have been through ups and downs in my marriage, right? So it's very similar. You start getting some discomfort, you start not liking certain things, you end up questioning why do you have to work, you know, 13, 14 hours for somebody else, even though you get paid really, really well, and you are very protected as an attorney in a big law firm in New York City because they need you, and because you know, they know that they really work you to the bone. So they have to pay well and they have to give you all the perks and things that you can never use, by the way, because honestly, you're there and uh, <laughs> all the time. So that all those perks are, you, I mean, whatever. And, um, you know, I got pregnant. And so I started to question if I wanted to show my child, unborn child, a life where, first of all, I was not going to be very present. And mm-hmm. second you know, kids learn by example and modeling. And so what was I going to teach my child that I was miserable, that I hated what I did, like being in a bad mood or whatever, right? And so these thoughts were kind of consuming me. And when I had the baby and I went back to the law firm. And so I spent the maternity leave, the three months and whatever. And so I went back but I already had this, all these thoughts, you know, circling my mind and it was just boiling inside of me. So something had to happen. Like the definitive event was having the baby and having to return to the law firm. And mm-hmm. then I went back and it, this was 2008. It's the whole world is collapsing around the financial crisis, the subprime mortgages, Bernie Madoff and the whole thing. And our clients at that law firm were big banks. So it's just this mess, right? And I'm in like the middle of all this with an, a you know, 12 week old baby at home. And I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I hate this. I absolutely have no desire to come here. Um, I leave the subway every day when I look at this place, it's frightening. I have like, you know, everything was like giving you so many signals of negativity around the whole thing. And I had to just like accept them and say to myself, I'm going to live the rest of my life a miserable life. And the more I stay here, the harder it'll be, right? And I'm not saying this to, if anybody has been in a job for 40 years and they just want to quit today, listen, you can do it, believe me. Uh, But for me, it was like, I have to get this done for two reasons. One, the most important one, I hate this. And second, I just really want to show my kid that life is about being whole and it's about being creative and it's about using your talents in the best possible way that you can. That's what life is about. It's about Mm -hmm. fulfillment. It's about finding passions and it's about really profiting from them because at the end of the day if you are excellent at something and you love it you're going to figure out how to capitalize on that and that is the mantra of my book is that anyone can actually come up with these incredible ideas and profit from them if they are honest with themselves Mm, i love that so your story really reminds me of a past guest we had on the show her name is gretchen rubin and she also Yes. Yep. She talks all about happiness and she talks about this concept of drifting. And basically this concept of drifting is that it's, it's this state of you being because of a decision you did by not deciding. It's basically like your state of not deciding. So you were drifting for nine years as a lawyer because you didn't decide that you wanted to do anything but doing law. And it was sort of like your default decision. Mm -hmm. And so you did it because you made your parents happy. And so other examples are you go to medical school because, you know, your parents are doctors or you take a job because it's the first job you got. And then you just stay in that career forever because that, that decision to change was not made. 
Um, so the other thing that I want to just call out is in the pandemic, a lot of people have had time to self-reflect and finally th they've, they've caused this point where they actually can make a change because they actually have time to stop the hamster wheel <laughs> and think about <laughs> what's going on and realize like, hey, I'm actually unhappy. I shouldn't just keep going with the motions of day to day and just keep drifting throughout life. So I'd love to understand, you know, you being an expert on creativity and business, how can being creative actually help us fuel a career change? Well, it's very interesting what you just said about the pandemic, because as you know, we are still going through the great resignation. And not mm -hmm. only that, but in 2020 and 2021, Americans filed more than 10 million applications for new businesses. This is a number that is unprecedented in the whole history of the United States. And it tells you two things. One, people were unhappy to a certain degree with what they were doing before. Two, is that these people are thinking that they can do something better than what they were doing before, or they can turn around their situation by being the masters of their own fate with their own businesses, right? So creativity is something that is uniquely human, right? Animals are not creative. They are smart. Animals have a level of intelligence for sure, but they are not creative. Mm. And when creativity and entrepreneurship are, you know, I think it's almost like intertwined concepts because when you start a business or a project or a podcast or a book or whatever it is, you have to differentiate yourself with your best skills, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to look like the next and you're going to look like the other one, or you're just going to drift, like you said, right? Because mm -hmm. you can anchor yourself in what is it that you do that is different. And creativity is all about coming up with ideas that are uniquely yours and that are of value, right? That's why you are so wonderful because Alataha has a point of view that is unique and novel and fresh. And when that doesn't work out for you anymore, you're going to be able to pivot again and do something else, like, you know, because that is part of our evolution of human beings is the growth that comes with understanding that your creativity is there for you to alert you also that you need to make a change and that you need to adjust things and that the things that actually at some point gave you a lot of pleasure and happiness might not necessarily be the same things to 10 years from now 20 years mm -hmm. from now right or faster we you know we're living in an accelerated age where things get old very quickly right mm. and um, so that personal fulfillment and that uniqueness of, of of each one of us is really crucial for a for success in business and people can be successful in business by being miserable too but it's not something that I can think will lead to a long-term, you know, success or something that you can say, well, listen, my life is balanced, right? Like I'm happy I'm doing this job. I, you know, it's, it's very difficult for people, especially nowadays to be on a miserable job for too long. I think mm -hmm. that things actually show much faster than they used to. And also, as we have seen with this influx of new businesses, people are taking chances on themselves. Yeah, I've been seeing that as well too. So I'd love to kind of go back to your story and kind of understand how you went from lawyer to <laughs> you know, having this amazing art company that you own right now. What was the transition and, and were you doing art throughout those nine years or, or dabbling in things? Like how did you actually make that switch? Well, when you said that I grew up in this artistic family, right? Like I had that little bug inside of me because I thought it was a fascinating thing that my parents had opened up these doors, right? Like they took me to gallery and museums, artist studios, you know, it was a very important part of my life, but my parents thought that was something that you do to nurture your soul and your spirit and to be a cultivated person so you can have conversations with people around a table, right? But not a business. But that thing stayed with me for my life. And when I moved to New York, thankfully, what New York has is a thousand galleries and a thousand museums. And so in my very spare time as a corporate attorney, I would go to these galleries in the museums and I had my finger on the pulse. It was a very different world because we didn't have Instagram and we didn't have any of the social media networks at the beginning. And so uh, you would have to go everywhere to experience these things and you would have to go in person and shake hands with people and, you know, all the things that, you know, right now we don't really do that much. Right. And so 
I started paying attention to the art world and I also started attending art fairs, Art Basel, when it opened. It was um, actually right after, it was in December after 9-11 when Art Basel in Miami opened for the first time. And so I went and I noticed that a lot of people who do the kind of job that I do were very stern and boring and transactional. And I was like, hmm, maybe I can do this better. Right as it, at the beginning, I sort of like, was like, oh my God, you know, it looks so fun what they're doing. But then as I noticed more, I was like, they don't seem to having, uh, be having that much fun. And as I, as social media came along, which was Facebook first and at least, you know, like the ones that became mainstream, let's say in Twitter, yeah. I realized that there was an opportunity for me there because I could educate people about the mysteries of the art world. I could teach people how to collect. I could talk to artists and interview them and demystify their process, make everything accessible. That was the mantra of the business when it opened. I mean, basically. Mm -hmm. So I saw that there was an opportunity for me because nobody was doing social media. Nobody was really kind of like wanting to bring this to the world. And because I was a good writer, I used that as my springboard to write first I had like a little very rustic and not very fancy blog and mm -hmm. then for whatever reason people found me there and then they invited me to contribute articles for the Huffington Post or you know or for L and I was like well I must be doing something right if I'm a complete outsider who's writing about things with, you know, a language that is understandable and people actually get it, right? It's like when you try nowadays to explain to people what an NFT is, I just came back from a TEDx talk where I explained to people what an NFT is and everybody's like, oh, now we get it, right? Like, because it's really, people try to make things more complicated than they are and they really are not, right? Like you can explain the same thing with like a fifth grade language or try to make the PhD dissertation thesis, which is not at all my style. So this is how the business started, basically. It was just, I said, I love this area. I obviously cannot be a singer anymore. And this is kind of the closest I'm going to get, right? And I think I can be successful because mm. I was recommending artists to my friends. And my friends were telling me, wow, what a hit. You recommended this artist. And like now the artist is like getting in the museums. And you always have this great eye for discovering talent. And you're so curious. And, you know, so I sort of like wanted to do something that I felt passionate about but I was also paying attention to the feedback around me that had to do with what my friends said it was a good opportunity for me and also what I saw was a good opportunity for me mm, I love what you're saying here because I think the best businesses and I always say this on my show the best businesses start from passion and from you just being curious and just trying to serve the world put out information and then it just seems like you organically evolved into becoming like a seven figure business and that's what happened to me too I started my podcast and it turned to a marketing agency now it's a network like it just like evolves as you realize and you become more of an expert and know what you're doing you start to realize the opportunities and how to monitor monetize what you're doing but it all starts with that little curiosity and having that passion so I love your story um I want to talk about Gwyneth Paltrow yes <laughs> so a year into you starting your blogging or a year and a half into it you got this opportunity to work for Gwyneth Paltrow uh -huh. how did that like kind of set off your career and what did you learn from that opportunity well you know Gwyneth gave me my first big break and it was so big it like literally launched everything for me and so this was so I opened the company in 2009 because I had the baby 2008 I was in the law firm went back and then I quit right and so I opened the company in 2009 and of course I'm hustling and you know shaking hands with people and going everywhere and writing and this and that right and then a friend tells me, I really love what you're doing. It's so interesting that you're trying to really clarify the art world for people and showing them how to do things. And 
I am going to introduce you to Gwyneth Paltrow, but it was so organic, right? It was not like, oh, please introduce me to Gwyneth. It was like, she said that, right? And so, mm-hmm. and she did. And I was like, this is my chance. So I told Gwyneth, this is what I do. And I, it was like my elevator pitch, right? But like, ev- I said, everybody should collect art. I think nobody should be priced out. Everybody can start collecting, you know, if they have a thousand dollars or $500 to spend, you know, I am really good at identifying the next talents. I always get, you know, this kind of right. And I love to, and so She's like, oh, my goodness, I love this. And so here's what I did. I had written an article for Forbes.com like the month before through an organization, Entrepreneur Women. I don't really remember. And I that that was one of the best articles I had written about because it was about demystifying the art world. And I think Forbes had given me like it's a thousand words. Or I don't know. So I printed the article and I put it on an um it, you know, seriously, it was so bad. <laughs> I put it in, printed the article, and I put it inside of a folder. And I, <laughs> and I, um, a friend of mine had a a company where they sold fine art photography, and so I got a fine art print from them that was inexpensive, but I wanted to show her that it was possible to like collect things that were not expensive but they were beautiful. So I just got that, and I sent it to her apartment, and this was let's say June or July, um, and I didn't hear anything until September. And then I like saw that I have a phone call that I have. I never really pick up my phone, so I see that I missed a call. And then I listen to the voicemail and say, hey, Maria, how are you? It's Gwyneth Paltrow. I just got to New York. I have not been in New York for so long. Thank you for what you sent me. It's so fantastic what you do. I would want you to please write a story for Goop. And this was 2011. It's like, you know, one and a half years and on, into my business. And I was like, wow, this is really massive. So I called her back and I said, what do you want? When do you want it for? Because at that time, Goop was Gwyneth and her assistant, editorial assistant. So it was just the two of them. And the headquarters of Goop was Gwyneth's house in London. That was it. There were two people and it was... I think every Thursday and you had a green background and that was it. So I wrote the story. It was like eight pages. They let me do anything I wanted. And I saw pictures, iPhone pictures. They were so bad. Hala, you have no idea (laughs) how bad this was. And I sent it all and they put it together. And when that thing was sent out, it's like my life changed because it was a different time, right? This was a once a week email. It was not a company. They had nothing else but the information and that's it, right? And so mine was like the guide to collecting and demystifying the art world. It's like everything changed for me that day. I got phone calls and emails from Art Basel, from like all the big, like, you know, wow. art, like amazing, 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 amazing. And so she gave me that big break and she gave me that, you know, trust, you know, and in that push, sort of like I need it, there was nothing at that time that could have helped me that much as she did. And, you know, she continues to be a champion of women and entrepreneurs. And uh, she's incredibly generous and, a, and an excellent human being who's built an incredible business herself and works really, really hard. And it's every day involved in the day-to-day operations of the business. So she's someone that I look up to because... Uh, not only is she so smart and beautiful, but also she is generous and a good person. Mm. So um, that's the Gwyneth Batra story. I love this story because I think the other kind of hidden gem in there was the fact that you weren't scared to just take the opportunity and just go for it. You didn't do this before. You didn't have guidelines. You weren't like sort of, uh, you were a professional at this, but you didn't like, you just took your past experiences, used them, to produce what Gwyneth wanted and then all these opportunities opened up and had you been scared to do that or late you know what I mean in (laughs) terms of like people procrastinate sometimes especially if they've never done something before and they lose opportunities so I think that's really special thank you I think I was never gonna let that go you know what I mean it's like (laughs) they said the deadline is you know in two weeks and I had it done in five days you know because I was like (laughs) 
<laughs> Whatever Gwyneth wants, Gwyneth gets, right? Yes. Um, so let's move on to your newest book, How Creativity Rules the World. It's going to be coming out right around when we air this show. I think March 18th it comes out or March, March 15th? 15th? March 15th. March 15th. Okay, yes. March 15th it comes out. And so creativity is this word that's thrown out a lot. Um, and I think people have a hard time understanding exactly the definition of creativity. So what is creativity in your own words? Creativity is your unique ability to come up with ideas of value that are relevant. And the word relevant is very important because it means that they serve a purpose in a marketplace today. Right. I mm. mean, it's not like it's not 20 years from now and it's not 10 years past creativity is all about being relevant and having those ideas that are uniquely yours. And that's what I said at the very beginning is that we all have so much to give and yet we stop because of so many things like fear is one of them. Another is like, I'm not good enough and I'm not creative enough. And you know, who am I thinking that I can be to disrupt a market or, you know, or who am I to believe that I can make waves in an industry? Well, I'm mm -hmm. here to tell you, you can, because I did it as an outsider of the art world, which is one of the most difficult and snub industries you will ever <laughs> imagine. And I am a, I'm an immigrant Latina with an accent. And I broke through all that because I had something to say and something to do that nobody else was doing. So mm. if you do not respect your ideas, they are not going to come because you are going to be discarding them without even kind of wanting to assess them, which is the most important thing is like, if you're having hunches and you're having images and you're having ideas, respect them, you know, listen to them, write them down, look at them, analyze them, you know, and also creativity is endless, you know, mm -hmm. because the more you put it out, like you said, you started in a way, then you grew on a, you know, you had a podcast, then that grew into an agent. It's like one thing leads into the other and the other and the other and that is because the more excellent ideas human beings have the more excellent ideas you will keep triggering and generating and the only mm. way that you can do that is by not only having the ideas but also executing them which is when most people fail is that they have the idea but they don't respect it and they don't execute mm. it because they don't feel they are they have what it takes or they feel that they need that everything has to be perfect from the get go or they need, you know, $50 million in funding or it, the biggest things and the biggest breakthroughs in life, in the world, in inventions, in businesses always start marginally, very small, mm. always. Yeah. So it sounds like you're starting to get into some myths. Uh, mm -hmm. related to creativity and I know in your book you outline seven different myths related to creativity so can you talk about some of those and let's debunk them well people sometimes think creativity is genetic and it's definitely not there is no gene that determines if anybody is going to be more if that were to be the case then you know uh, there would be like Steve Jobs and his siblings let's say right like they will all be like you know no that's not the case um I mean, he was adopted and whatever, but it's just an example. Or Leonardo da Vinci, right? Or Michelangelo, mm -hmm. like, you know, or Picasso, right? Who had sisters. So, no, there's no nothing. And I went and I, like, read, like, maybe, you know, 25 studies on genes and creativity. That's not, it's not. The other thing is, for example, that creativity cannot be learned, which is kind of like the whole backbone of my ideas is that, we actually are born extremely creative, but as we get older and we are exposed to formal education and the schools teach us what to think instead of how to think, and we are, you know, LSATs, a standardized test, bar exams, everything is measured through those lenses, which is really stupid if you think about it, because people's creativities and intelligences cannot be circumscribed to an X or like filling around, you know, in, a, in an answer sheet. So the more humans are exposed to that, the more we stifle our creativity. But there is a way to relearn to think like a child, right? And that's why I have a whole set of uh, exercises and and um, ideas and blueprints on the book on how people can put that together, right? The other thing is like, 
well, only a handful of people can be creative, but well, how so? If it's something so human, if we have seen studies that children perform at the highest level of creativity and the same kids when they are tested at the age of 30, they perform at 2%, that means that you have already had this inside of you all the time, but you have decided to see the world to put a special type of lenses that takes away everything that is incredible. And, mm. uh, you know, so the, the other thing is the left brain and the right brain. So this was debunked by a Nobel Prize uh, physician. And, and it's, you know, the brain needs both hemispheres to work perfectly well, right? A lot of people in math, they you would think they are left-brained. However, math is one of the fields where like the most creative things can happen. If you think about mm. coding, if you think mm. about formulas, if you think about like algorithms, you know, they all happen in, in math equations, right? So those people are not left-brained and they are not right-brained. There is an interconnection and interdependence of both sides. It is a matter of not physiology, but is how do you develop your talents, right? I mean, there I have two kids and they are excellent at math and I'm not, you know, I mean like, and, and that's the thing, right? Like they are, they love math, they're sharp, but you know, but they are also super artistic too. And so I'm like, always kind of thinking, well, they can be both things if they want to. And I hope they develop, you know, passions in life and whatever they decide to do when they are older. But for the time being, I can see that both sides are robust. And so it depends on each one of us if we want to strengthen the connections. And I don't necessarily have to be a math genius because what my, my left brain is logical, right? And so I don't do things that are crazy. I am very intuitive using my right side, but I also go with logical things. And, you know, I say, well, I'm going to take a calculated risk. It's not that I'm just going to go and put all my money in crypto right now, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about, like, what do I need to do to balance both sides of my brain constantly? And those are part of the myths that I write about in the book, and I give every one of them there is a specific study that I consider was the, the definitive study and I give people that data too because a lot of people are like well this can be anecdotal where are you getting this Maria here it is it's you know it's 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 in the studies that psychologists and researchers spend you know I don't know how many years tracking people to prove this to you Mm -hmm. And I was telling you offline, you know, I read like two books a week and your book was so well written, jam packed with so much great research, so many great example stories, plus your own experience. It was really great. So I can't wait to dig into some strategies of, uh, of how we can actually hone in our creativity. Um, there's a couple stats that I just want to list out to my listeners that I think is really interested. So in your book, you say a LinkedIn study showed that the number one in-demand skill turns out to be creativity. And during the pandemic, the World Economic Forum called creativity the one skill that will future-proof you for the job market. So I'd love to hear from you why you think creativity is so important in terms of a skill to have in 2022 and beyond. Well, you know, um, Hala, a lot of people, and, and this is not new, a lot of people have been substituted by machines, right? And that's a problem. But if you think about it, were those people the ones who were constantly reinventing themselves at their jobs? Or yeah. were those the people who actually just pushed buttons and accepted the status quo as it was, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing is to be said for people who have businesses because you know, you might say, well, but I'm an accountant. Uh, that's not creativity. Of course it is creativity. I just read about an accountant who has a very thriving business of uh, a tax, you know, preparation business because he's a comedian. And so he has a team of comedians and like everybody wants to work with him too because <laughs> he is so funny and so personable. And so he's not going to be just written off by because TurboTax does it for a hundred bucks, right? I mean, it's just like, it's how do you 
present your world, your ideas, your business. Why is it that the World Economic Forum and LinkedIn, and not only that, IBM too did a whole study on creativity through the CEOs of the companies of uh, 1,500 companies in, I don't know, 70 different industries in, I don't know, 150 countries, and they all agreed it was creativity. What they were looking for when they wanted to keep people employed and who they wanted to actually hire. Adobe mm. also did this study. And uh, what Adobe found is that one in four people say, I'm not creative enough and I don't have the tools to be creative. But the tools are not things you're going to go to the hardware store to buy and they are not things that you're going to find in like the most advanced computer. The tools are within and they are very simple, but they need work. And, you know, sometimes people think, well, what kind of work? It is, you know, five, 10 minutes a day, everybody can actually build those creative skills and think outside of what it's been given to them, right? I mean, the, the, the I hate the word that I think outside the box thing. It, that, it, it's like, it feels so old school to me, but I think that people are familiar with that, think outside mm-hmm. the box, right? And so, you know, we as, you know, as humans in this very fast paced world need to be constantly adjusting and adopting things and changing the way we see things. And, you know, uh, there is a famous investor in on Wall Street. His name is Peter Lynch. And Peter is, um, I think he's at Fidelity, if I'm not mistaken, but I, it, sorry, Peter, if you're not there. I think you are. Um, and what Peter Lynch teaches his analysts Peter is very old now but what he teaches his analysts and what he does and he's this is one of the guys who has the, one of the strongest track records in investments in the whole history of Wall Street what he teaches his analysts besides being you know paying attention and being you know great is like go out in the world and do things differently because no incredible breakthrough, no incredible experience, no incredible investment comes from place of complacency, of being, you know, taking business as usual, right? Everything that is amazing in this world comes from curiosity, from wanting to explore intersections of two or more different industries. It comes from a desire to do something that nobody else has done it comes from you know if somebody does one thing one way and continues to do that it'll at some point it'll become best practices feel very allergic to this word when you this term when you hear it because best practices means it's been done so much that it has been codified right and that's nothing creative Mm. in in best practices i'm not saying go against the manual that they give you in your office right and like write graffiti on the walls no that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is that once you have gotten used to a certain way of doing things feel a little worried about that and if you're Mm. very comfortable in what you're doing and you feel like it's a smooth sailing feel a little worried about that because the discomfort that you feel when you're trying to do something new is a very good indication that you are exploring creative territories. If Mm -hmm. everything is very stable all the time and everything is like easy, that is also a clear signal that you're not growing and you're not getting into a very creative spot, right? Everything Mm. that is amazing, like writing this book was a challenge, right? I mean, it was in the middle of the pandemic. I have a business, I have two kids. And yet I said, I'm going to do this. And I, you know, plow through the whole thing, inventing new parts of my business, like the consulting part of you know, entrepreneurship and, and being in front of CEOs of companies and giving them workshops around creativity and whatnot was difficult too. And it was uncomfortable, but I loved it. And I, I thought, well, this is something that I want to explore. I have never said no to my urges. If they come consistently, I have never said no. I, you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to go and put like a million bucks into a division of a business that might not go anywhere. You know what I mean? It's like, it's calculated risks, right? But I have done things that Mm. I never thought I was going to do. I, you know, I did manufacturing in collaboration with artists for 
three years and I learned a ton, but it was so hard and unsatisfying. I mean, we mm. got the money, we actually made profits, but it was so complicated. I was like, oh my goodness, no wonder manufacturing is on the decline in this country because it's so difficult to do. And, uh, but I, you know, I think it's part of, um, it's part of that desire of, of like not be at standstill. That is the, the, the feeling of being stuck is for, for leaders, for curious people, for fun people, is one of the most damaging things for anybody's career, right? And that's why mm -hmm. those studies and the LinkedIn and the World Economic Forum are telling you, be unique, be creative, right? I mean, avoid getting replaced by a yeah. machine, right? Yeah, when I think of creativity, I think of problem solvers, right? Like, and for me, I, I'm a very naturally creative person. Now I think I've become more and more creative as I've gotten older, and I feel like it's like a superpower. Like, I literally never get afraid of any sort of project in front of me because I just figure out how to be creative, create creative solutions, and just do it. You know what I mean? I, I feel like I always say this. My focus can change the world if I focus on it. And, you know, I'll just figure it out because I'm creative and I'm open minded. So there's two concepts that you bring up in your book that I think you kind of hit on that I want to talk about. The first is autonomy. So I'd love to understand, you know, how autonomy is. You, you did touch on it a little bit, but I'd love to hear it in more depth in terms of how autonomy is related to creativity. And then also the ability to trust your instincts and why that's important. Well, autonomy is is so important because it is your believe in yourself and mm -hmm. that your ideas are good and that you're going to explore them and that whatever comes out of them, something good can be implemented. And when you have a herd mentality and groupthink, which is pretty common nowadays, if you ask me, is obviously not creative. And um, you can have models because nothing is 100% new, right? I mean, if you think about it, we're building on what has been created before, right? And Steve Jobs did not invent the phone and he did not invent the music player, right? This was like combinations of things that were previously in the world. And so we have models and we have ideas and we have uh, passions, right? I mean, and so, but it's how we recombine all these elements in our very own unique way and how we have the autonomy to believe that what we think is going to be the next step is going to be right. And, or, mm -hmm. or n nobody has a hundred percent certainty of anything, but autonomy in your convictions and in the way you think and uh, why you're going to pursue what you're going to pursue is very important for creativity and for entrepreneurship, for sure. And so I urge people throughout the book also to, yes, it's fine to get feedback. It's very important if you have a team or if you have investors or if you are, you know, in, in like you have a boss, right? Like, I mean, it's very important to have feedback, but it's also very important to be able to speak up when you think something should be taken into consideration, when you think something, you know, has to be new. A lot of businesses would have never existed if the founders would, would have gone with the first person who told them no, right? I mean, like Airbnb couldn't get any money until actually they said that they were going to move the focus from people who was going, you know, people who were going to go to conferences onto like a different view, which is the vacation market. So when, when they moved the, the kind of perspective, instead of saying this is for conference people, they say, no, why don't we make this for people who go on vacation and they don't want to stay into and like in hotels? That's when the money started to pour in like crazy. And, but for, for the longest time, it wasn't happening. And all they needed to move was like, you know, like three degrees to like mm. see the other thing that was happening, right? And so once you have a great idea, as I said before, respect it and mine it. And it might not end up being that, but it might end up being built on that foundation. And that is mm. important. And autonomy also goes along with being a person who can analyze and and synthesize a lot of different points of view mm. so that you don't have to go with 
the majority the mainstream is already mainstream if you know what i'm saying right i mean it's like you're autonomous you're not gonna go and do what everybody else is doing that's why the the most interesting things are happening in the periphery are happening in the periphery of you know the big businesses and the big things and and that's part of being autonomous yeah okay so there's a bunch that i want to get into (laughs) here (laughs) so first of all i'd love to get some advice practical advice or, or exercises we can do to start being more independent thinkers and then my second kind of practical advice that i'd like you to give our listeners is to help us become or what are your tips for us to become more hyper aware of what's actually going on? Because like you said, Airbnb just needed to pivot three degrees. So mm-hmm. how can we be more aware of those little nuances around us? All right. Well, so one thing that has been lately exposed a lot is the echo chamber, right? The echo chamber where we're like listening the our own voices. We only get the algorithm feed that we already have been used to and we hang out with the people that think like us and you know people are having all this political fights in families and whatever right as so that is a space where you can be extraordinarily benefited from the idea of mingling yourself with people who think differently and that mm-hmm. is very important as someone who really wants to build a creative mindset right it doesn't have to it doesn't mean you're going to agree with the other people but it means that you are going to be able to get yourself informed by other points of view and we Mm -hmm. don't have that that often anymore i think that i have watched a couple of very interesting people being observant and and like silent and those people are usually the ones with the best business ideas right like the ones who are watching everything and not just what they want to watch right and and not just people who look and speak like them and so it's very important to open up space for that and that again that doesn't mean negotiating your convictions it just means having the willingness to see other points of view Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that what you said about uh, the um, Airbnb and people's, you know, ideas of what can you do to to pay more attention to what's happening. In fact, paying attention is one of the most important things that we can do. And we're not doing it because we are overwhelmed again with technology and news and bad things happening everywhere all the time. And, you know, the you know, big media is always competing for our attention. They want it, they need it. And I believe that people need to spend more time alone in silence with themselves. There is a study that I quote in the book as well of students who were offered either to stay for 10 minutes alone or they could stay those 10 minutes alone. And if they were feeling bored, they could give themselves an electrical shock right and it was quite kind of painful the majority of the students decided that they wanted to have the electrical shock because they were bored they could not be they could not be 10 minutes alone on their own this is a problem (laughs) this is a problem because it is where ideas have to marinate and you need the pockets of silence to have the time and the space to have you know, those ideas come to the surface. Mm -hmm. And it could be that you don't get the idea until you're in the yoga class. It could be that you're, you get the idea when you're driving home or when you are walking the dog, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, the point is that without pockets of silence and without moments of being with yourself alone, you're not gonna be able to have the flourish, you know, like the, the ideas to flourish and to germinate in the best possible way. So Mm -hmm. I encourage people to really spend more time alone and to schedule it and make it a part of like your life, right? I mean, I have had students who've told me, yeah, but I spend time alone every morning, but I play music. I said, that's not what I am asking you to do. I mean, it's the same thing as electrical shock. This person needed the music. You know, she's like, but it's very zen and it's very instrumental. And I said, that's great, but you are stimulating 
parts of your brain and parts of your ear and part you know like your senses with the music and what i want you to do is to be alone with in silence mm. 10 minutes give me five i said five minutes right and so once people start incorporating these things in their lives they start seeing a lot of things that they missed before because they give a space to the brain to actually process all their information and to come up with those ideas Mm, I think this is really important. So what she's saying is that give yourself silence every single day. And that might be hard if you're in like a job that has an open co-working space or you're, you know, you've got a busy family. So what is your advice for people who like want to create this creativity incubator, as you call it in your book, I believe? Uh, what is your advice, you know, if they feel like they have a really busy life that doesn't really allow for that? Well, listen, I'll, there is a... Uh not a, it's not a coincidence that a lot of people get their best ideas when they are taking a shower. <laughs> it's the truth. And why is that? It's because it's the only time where people are alone and mm. they have that space to think, right? And so I would say if you can be in the bathroom, locked doors five minutes, right? I mean, five minutes before you even take that shower. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. Put on like the timer, right? Then use that time to think. Um, you know, I, 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 I would love to say take a walk and taking a walk is good because it gets things moving, but you will have to be stimulated by your surroundings because, you know, if you're going to cross a street, you have to look, you know, uh, both sides of the road and you have to pay attention to, uh, the lights and whatnot. Right. So while taking a walk has an important part, you know, it's an important thing for everybody because really ideas get moving. It is not the same as spending time alone in one place with nothing else but you and your thoughts, whatever they are. Sometimes, you know, I like people like to meditate and that word has so many different connotations and a lot of people think no it's going to be so difficult and i have to be in a chamber with buddhas and like you know infrared sauna and incense no man it's just like meditate is just trying to breathe and, and keep your mind as clean as possible so if people have really a crazy busy life if you can take those five minutes while you're in the bathroom and nobody's bothering you, I think you're going to see miracles in a week or two. Like you're mm -hmm. going to start seeing a lot more ideas, but you've got to be willing to do it, right? I mean, it's not just listening. It's uh, you've got to practice. Yes. All right. So let's move on to some other key concepts. You talk about authenticity as being crucial when it comes to honing your creativity. So why is it that the most creative ideas are always the most personal as well? Well, because all of us have had our own set of experiences in this world. We have had our parents, our bringing, the schools that we have attended, the places that we have lived. And we recombine all those experiences in our very own specific way. So whatever is uniquely yours, I think it is the most creative, no matter what you want to do, whether it is a restaurant or an accountant an accounting business or a podcast whatever it is right or an agency because you bring yourself to the table and that's what we said before about machines replacing humans and why if you're creative you can never be replaced right because you have all those experience and, and it's, it's a cumulative thing right because as you move forward in life you have already learned so many things that are just yours and you have interpreted things in a way that is uniquely yours that's that's why you have an agency because you saw an opportunity and you saw how to develop things within the agency and you took all the things that you had learned into what it is right now and mm -hmm. probably as I told you before you, you will accumulate more experiences and you will use those experiences for other things right I mean I the things that I knew when I started the business are very different because they were limited in a way I came with all myself but as the business grew I learned things that were uniquely mine and I utilized those very unique experiences to not only, you know, create what I have, but also to write the book because a lot of this anecdotes mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that have to do with my life and the, so no, nobody else can write the book. You know what I mean? Because I saw things in the very same, you know, in a way that I did. And the beauty of that is that the world then interprets its own way, right? I mean, I like many different people like you who have read the book have very different opinions about it 
positive, but different, right? And it all depends on how you filter your reality, right? And uh, I think it's it's super important, you know, like if you are, for example, in the business of creating content, if you, you know, like see the um, enormous amount of movies and, you know, Netflix series and whatnot, the most successful ones are the ones that are really coming from the heart of the showrunner or the producer or the director or the screenwriter you know it's not an idea that has been forced and commissioned right like here Mm -hmm. it's like you know it's it's like the things that come from within and the things that people have experienced what really color all the you know all the, the the creative parts of what you put out in the world Mm, I love that. So there's a couple concepts that I want to unpack here, and it's improvisation and aggregation. So in terms of improvisation, once you know the basics, you can break away and become innovative. So I'd love for you to kind of help us understand this concept and how we can use it in business. Well, when you're in business, you are supposed to know what you know, in other words, right? Like you're, you're getting paid to be a certain expert or something in what you do, right? And uh, you have learned a set of rules or you have learned to do things in a specific way. And once you have mastered those things is when you can really take certain chances, right? I mean, and I'm not talking about like the beginning of a startup because yes, you can take chances in a, the beginning of a startup, but you still don't know what you're doing with a business, right? So assuming you've been, you know, two years uh, on the or in your career in a big company or medium-sized company and you have learned a lot of rules and you have learned a lot of procedures and you have learned how to do things. That is the space where you need to be able to take chances in improvisation, right? And so improv in business, uh, a lot, I, I like this technique that was originally patented, if you will, by Del Close, who was a, a comedian and, and an acting coach. And it was the yes and technique where you keep the ball rolling, right? And so if you have a client who calls you and says, I need this today at 5 p.m. and you know it's impossible, you have to like, you don't say no, because it shuts down the conversation immediately. The client gets upset, whatever. You say, Yes, and let's review the scope of this project to see if we can actually get it done tonight at five, right? I mean, that is a way of improvising at work, uh, you know, by pushing yourself out of the comfort zone of what you would normally do, taking a chance and seeing what happens, right? I mean, and you know, participating actively of the conversation, but by the same token, the you know, some of the most incredible inventions in life have been accidents, right? I mean, and so, and and that happened too because people were willing to improvise with the materials. They were willing to improvise with the order of the steps that they had to get there. They were willing to, to you know, experiment. And all these things are so intertwined that we can really talk about them all day long because it's it's like almost one concept is married to another and it's you know best friends of another and it's the father or mother because they are all so important but they have nuances that differentiate them from you know the other ideas or tools or techniques and then you mentioned aggregation well can i pause you yes because i i want to make sure that my listeners really understand this concept so i think it may be helpful if you explain how improvisation is used in the art world or for artists Mm -hmm. because I think that will help them understand how they can then apply it to business well look um for example Jackson Pollock right I mean who wrote the book of like the the modern era in the United States as an abstract expressionism and I am sure everybody's familiar with his work he started painting landscapes and uh you know figures and whatnot right that, like any other you know painter you have to start somewhere and he had this big studio in in the hamptons and he's like i want to do something different and remember this was a time where the united states was flourishing from it's funny we talk about this from the second world war and um and set and like it but entering the cold war with russia that's what i said it's crazy so it was ent- it was like in the midst of the cold war and the united states says i want to differentiate myself from the russians and i am going to do this through art and so um 
this movement of men and women, the abstract expressionists, they wanted to break with everything that had to do with European style and, you know, cubism and impressionism. And so Jackson Pollock said, well, I already know everything I need to know. According to him, he said, I already need to, everything I need to know about painting flowers or landscapes and I'm going to experiment. And nobody else was doing that. And what he did is like he stretched a piece of canvas on the floor of his giant studio in the Hamptons. And he took a piece, you know, he took house paint, which is very fluid and it's not like oil paint that is thick and whatever. And instead of using a brush, he found a couple of sticks and knives and he started just splattering the whole thing and, and moving himself with it. Right. And so this is improvisation. He just mm. didn't know where it was going to go. It was an experiment. And it turns out that when he finished, he was like, oh, this is very cool and interesting. And I have never seen anything like that before. Now we take it for granted. Now we say, well, this guy was just flattering. But at the time, nobody else was doing it. And the same thing is jazz. Jazz is all about improvisation. There is a certain amount of notes and, and you know, compositions that the musicians have to play and they have... But then, you know, the saxophone does one thing and, you know, the piano does something else. And and it's like that improvisation what has made jazz what it is and people love it. And it's the same thing with hip hop because a lot of these lyrics are, you know, off the cuff. And it's like mm -hmm. improvising, you know, and seeing, you know, so it's it's just like the concept is so broad and it can be really applied to so many different um, mm -hmm. You know, part like when I the example I give in my business is a client who asked me for a Banksy painting and I was like, how am I going to get to Banksy? I mean, does he even exist? She like the client said is for my husband's birthday and I, um, you know, I, I want to buy it from the studio. I don't want to buy it from, you know, a gal it, it, the truth is a lot of fake Banksy's and things happen. And so I was like, how am I going to do this? And I told her, of course, I'm going to get you a Banksy. And I could have said, no, it's impossible. But I improvised my, you know, it was like, I said, yes, of course, I'm going to get you a Banksy. And I went like crazy until I found a connection who could have connected me to Banksy Studio. And they did. And then my client called again and said, oh, thank you. But you know what? I really want to go there and see it in person. I was like, oh, my God. Yes, of course you can go, you know. And so it was like me moving the ball forward. And by the way, if you ask Elon Musk, once he is in front of his investors, if he can send people to the moon, if the Tesla is going to work, he's going to say always yes. And and then he's going to leave the room and he's going to say, how the F I'm going to make this happen. <laughs> and that is true. And that is it, it's both an improvisation and it's also a risk taking move because mm -hmm. you're going to figure. And, you know, Steve Jobs also did the same, like, the, you know, like. He, like they said, it's impossible what you want to do with that phone. It's never going to look the way you want it to look and whatever. And he said, yes, it's going to happen. And I already told everybody it's going to happen and you have to make it happen. You know what I mean? It's like, so it's a little bit of, um, I don't want to put it in a way that is wishful thinking because for you to take this risks and this improvisations, you actually have to have enormous knowledge to mm -hmm. actually take the chance, right? I mean, when I my client told me to find Banksy, is I was not a complete like stranger of the art world like I was on day one. I had already had the business for almost two years. So I said, I don't know Banksy. I don't even know if Banksy exists, but I am going to talk to the street artists that I know and see if they can connect me, you know? So I had a foundation that served me well at that time, right? It's not like if somebody asked me tomorrow about an area that I have no clue, I'm not going to improvise there because it's going to sound yeah. terrible, right? But, you know, like I said before, when these guys are promising things to their investors or their board of directors or something, they know that there is a 60% chance that it can't get done or 65 yeah. or whatever, right? So, and that is very important for creativity because it pushes you to get to the point where you're going to materialize what you thought at some point it was not possible. Yeah. So... 
I have a quote from your book that I think sums this up really nicely. The paradox of improvisation is that the more prepared and competent you are, the more creative and unpredictable you can be. <laughs> yes, and that is also, you know, how comedians and stand-up comedy happens and you know that's how once you know your craft you can really get and explore the tangents you can go and like think about promises that maybe would have seemed outlandish otherwise uh, you can mix if you're a chef you can start mixing you know flavors that would never come together but you have to experiment and you have to improvise in the kitchen because that's how you keep the people wanting for more so I think that this is a concept that is super applicable to every facet of life and it can really also be amazing for decision making, you know, for when you're, you have to decide something fast and, uh, you know, improvise. So let's talk about one last concept and then let's move to closing the interview. So I'd love to understand the concept of deconstruction and aggregation and how that relates to art in both business. Well, so deconstruction is taking the, the pieces apart, right? And so in the, for example, in art, all the ideas of Picasso and cubism were isolating pieces, right? And so it was an arm here and a foot there. And then, you know, if you look at Guernica, you know, one of the most important pieces of art in the whole world and the history of humanity, it's all about pieces of bodies that were dismembered in the war, mm -hmm. right? And so they have so much more impact that way. And in business, you know, deconstructing parts, for example, of like what happened, I, I gave the example of uh, Zenith, right? Like when they invented the remote control, the remote control used to be a thing that was a panel attached to the TV and it had wires and whatnot. And so they were like, how do we make this? How do we profit from this? Because they were making television sets but they also were like and if we can invent something separately with this wouldn't that be cool so they separated something that was attached and they create they invented their remote they were the inventors of the remote right and look now we have remotes for everything right the AC and apps and you know the car and whatever so it's been like an incredible invention that came from deconstructing and separating things Twitter is a deconstruction project because when it was founded, it was like, how do we make something that is just this amount of characters, right? And so it is not aggregating, it is deconstructing. And same thing with any business. When you think about, maybe you have too many things. Maybe one of them has to be deconstructed and separated and, and, and it, it just may not need it anymore, right? And so you have to ponder um, if everything that is in your business right now is worth having or if it's, mm. you know, or if it's needed to the, for the whole thing to separate it in pieces, right? And, and aggregation is the, the opposite is Facebook is, you know, an aggregation project because it is, you know, is the picture, is the like, is the, you know, the messenger, is the, uh, you know, I mean, all these things, actually, Twitter added many things after, but remember that for many years, it was just microblogging right and but Facebook came with a very different strategy it was like how do we make this a community where people hang out for the longest time right and so they kept adding things the shopping and the g games and uh, you know the business and the experiences and this and that so it was like if we add more things we're gonna keep people on for the longest time right and so mm -hmm. Um, both are, you know, it's, it's not that one is better than the other or anything. It's just that they are very different ways of seeing uh, a business, um, you know, concept or an idea. And so how do you filter them through those two? And I think that I, you know, I, I like to give the reader this two, you know, opposites so that they think about what they need at any given time in their businesses, in their careers. And this book is, is, you know, heavily oriented towards people in business, people in positions of entrepreneurship, people who own companies or people who want to become intrapreneurs. And that concept is mm -hmm. not that very, is not that very explored. Usually the idea that you can, if you're a part of an organization, be your own leader and bring all these ideas to whatever it is that you do so that 
it doesn't happen what we said before that you don't become obsolete and you don't get replaced by machines. Mm -hmm. I love this concept of deconstruction and aggregation. It's just a new way to like think about things and come up with creative solutions and come up with ideas that could be the next, you know, $50 billion company like Twitter was. So I love the Twitter example in particular because they took blogging, which at the time was so, so popular and was, it's basically, you know, lots of words, many different thoughts. And then they deconstructed it to a single tweet. And, and built a whole billion dollar business around that. So it just goes to show how powerful this could be. Absolutely. And it's just one simple idea. You know, if you think about it, it's just one simple idea. Sometimes complexity is the enemy of execution, you know? Mm. And so it, that's not for everybody. Sometimes people love to have very complex, complex projects at hand and to get into very, uh, you know, ambitious, businesses with many moving parts there's nothing wrong about that but sometimes a very simple idea can actually be you know a billion dollar idea or more mm -hmm. if it gets to be presented right and i think marketing is also a very important creative skill and ability and uh you know for people in marketing this book is going to be really relevant and important for them because i think that they will keep coming back to find, uh, you know, ideas and concepts and uh, to refresh their memory, like, you yeah. know. Yeah, 100%. So this was so great, guys. Everybody tuning in, we covered about 10% of her book. There's so much more information. Every single page was just like packed with so much gems and great information. I read a ton of books all the time. And a lot of the time it's like sifting through fluff. It was like there was every page had like a gem and honestly I had like 50 questions prepared this for this interview because there was just so much in there so I highly recommend for everybody to go grab her book Maria I know that you have a special offer just for our yap listeners can you tell us about that yes so I am going to give for free my creativity online course and other bonuses and resources that are worth like $650 for free if you pre-order my book or you order it. And so I'm keeping it open until the 18th of March at midnight Eastern time. And all you have to do is email your receipt to book at mariabrito.com. That's Maria and B R I T as in Tom O dot com and say Hala told me. That's it. Hala told me. Because I'm keeping it open just for you guys. Awesome. And the book is called How Creativity Rules the World. It is out on March 15th. Make sure you guys go get that. So I always close out my interviews uh, with the same last couple of questions and we do some fun stuff at the end of the year with them. So what is one actionable thing our listeners can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? I think pay attention to three different media sources that are not from the same place that you'd normally get your information from mm. and what is your secret to profiting in life my secret to profiting is my creativity really it is my superpower like you said I align with that so much because I think that as long as I can come up with ideas I'm going to keep succeeding and I'm going to keep making money off of them there is absolutely nothing that I think about as I said before that I shy my way from exploring if I believe I can serve and also I believe I can make it viable and monetize it. So mm. it's all about being creative and innovative. I love that. And where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Well, come to my website. It's mariabrito.com, B-R-I-T-O. I said that before. And there are all the links to social media, uh, an email form if you want to just say hi come hang out there with me i have a weekly newsletter on creativity and business it's called the groove so and it's free always and it will always be it gives me great pleasure to do these things and so that's that's where i am going to be found for as long as i live <laughs> awesome and we'll stick all those links in the show notes thanks again maria it was such a pleasure thank you taha and everybody thank you for hanging with us this long thanks for listening to young and profiting podcast if you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. 
Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off. Thank you.